Good morning, common ground. Can you hear me loud enough? Great. So this is wonderful Sunday, third Sunday of the Advent season. So the topic is the joy. So I hope you enjoy, enjoy during this worship service. Who are? You know, I uh, when I was invited to a local Korean church, because I I was so used to saying "hua" instead of "amen," very often by mistake, right? <laughs> I said "hua" instead of "amen," so I'm still struggling with the "amen" and "hua." When Jesus was born, there were two groups of people who came to worship the newborn baby. One was the shepherds in the field in Luke chapter two and the other was the wise man from the east, which was just described in today's text. According to Jewish religious law, both groups were considered unclean. Shepherds were not only social outcasts, but also spiritually unclean. They had to constantly care for the sheep and were not able to adhere all the extra ceremonial laws and cleanest stipulations that Pharisees imposed on people. The wise men, the Magi, were Gentiles, people who were outside the Israelites. Therefore, they were unclean too. So according to Jewish religious law, both the shepherds and the wise men from the east were farthest from God. But the irony is that on the night of Jesus' birth, those who were farthest came closest to God. What do you think made these two groups of people come to worship the newborn king before anybody else? It was their sincere desire for God in their lives. The shepherds were the ones who needed God's help most in the lowest position of their society. And the Magi were the people who had a yearning for truth. In other words, both groups were full of learning for God. Who can come close to God? Who qualifies for God's grace? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't even matter what you have been through. As long as you have a longing for God, as long as you humbly acknowledge your need for God in your lives and seek his help qualify for God's grace. So my prayer for all of you who are here in this worship service and people who are watching our service is that we all experience wonderful God's grace during this season with our seeking and desiring heart. Amen. So today, we're going to look at the topic of joy during this Advent season. If you read verse 10 in today's text, it says that when they, the Magi, the wise men, saw the star, they were overjoyed. The word overjoy does not deliver the original meaning of this verse fully. So if we look at Verse 10, in Greek and English, side by side, we can better understand the magnitude of this verse. So it goes like this. Exaresan means they rejoiced. Spodra, exceedingly. Megaland, you can guess, right? Mega, Megaland with a great Quran jo joy. So if I translate it 
word by word from Greek to English, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. There are many verses in the Bible talking about joy, but we never find a verse like this describing the word joy this intensely in the same verse. Rejoicing exceedingly with a great joy. What that means is that we can easily imagine how joyful the wise men were when they found the baby Jesus. True joy is lasting, not fleeting. So when do you feel joy? When in your life have you felt such indescribable joy as the Messiah did in today's text? For me, there were some moments of joy in my life, including witnessing the birth of my first child. But while I was preparing this sermon, one moment in particular stand, stands out in my memory. It was a 2017 when I was stationed in Germany. Our unit was frequently deployed for training exercise throughout Germany. So one time, I was in the field for training and near the end of the training, I was looking at my hand and suddenly noticed that my wedding ring was missing. It was a winter, so I always put my gloves on. So I probably didn't notice that my, my ring slipped away from my finger. And also, when you are at the field, right, you always feel hungry. I must have lost some weight. So when I found out that the ring I had been wearing for 28 years, by that time, had disappeared, my heart stopped for a moment. Can you imagine the panic I experienced at that moment? You may never, never imagine. So I desperately looked around everywhere for the ring, but I couldn't figure out where it had been lost. With the gloves on and off countless times, it was almost impossible to know where a ring might have fallen. I searched all the places I went during the training. I also asked soldiers to look for my ring around their tents and everywhere for finding the small ring at a hilly mountain was almost impossible. Eventually, I gave up and I had to confess the truth to my wife after I came back from the training. Can you guess what my wife's response was? I married a generous woman. My wife was gracious enough to forgive me for the lost ring. And we comforted each other by planning to buy a new wedding ring for both of us. A few weeks later, while I was arranging my military gear at home, I saw something shining in my rucksack. To my surprise, I found the ring inside of the rucksack. Hallelujah. <laughs> the ring must have fallen inside while I was pulling up my military gear in the field. Thankfully, inside of the rucksack. You may not imagine how joyful I was. I'm still wearing this one. It was the ring. I had been looking for so desperately that when it was unexpectedly found in my rucksack, I was so joyful as if I had gained the whole world. When have you felt this kind of joy in your life? Have there been any moments in your life you can still feel the joy of excitement? or a good surprise. 
Today, I want to talk about the famous wise man story, which we all know so well from the Bible. I believe this story gives us very inspiring messages for anyone who wants to experience the same joy this wise man felt 2,000 years ago. Especially while we are waiting for the birth of Jesus Christ, I want all of us to rejoice exceedingly with a great joy on Christmas Day. So in today's text, we find the wise men from the east coming to Jerusalem to look for a newborn king. It was very natural for them to come to Jerusalem for a king, where the king's palace was. A king should be born in a palace, right? I don't know why Jesus was born in a manger. But the problem was that at that time, nobody was expecting a new king in Jerusalem. So everybody got very disturbed when they saw the wise man looking for a new king in Jerusalem. We can easily imagine why people were so disturbed by this. In those days, two kings in the same kingdom meant a political turmoil, which naturally reminded people of a war. That is why King Herod was also very disturbed when he heard this. But soon, King Herod realized that the new king was meant for the Messiah, Christ. So he called together all the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, and asked them where the Messiah was to be born. To this king's question, they, priests and the teachers of the law, answered by quoting the quote we just read, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, You honor, it is in Bethlehem of Judea, as recorded in the Holy Scripture, they answered. Who are these priests and the teachers of the law? They are the subject matter experts on the word of God. The Bible is their specialty. They write, read, and memorize the Bible every day. They all have a PhD in the Bible. Therefore, King's question was very easy for them to answer. They must have been very proud of themselves for answering the king's question so quickly without any hesitance. But when I read today's scripture, the priests and teachers of the law are very contrasted with the wise man from the east. Did the wise man have the Bible? No, they did not. Though they had no knowledge of God's word, they came this far by just looking at a star to worship the newborn baby Jesus. What motivated them to embark on this long, unpredictable journey? It was their truth-seeking hearts. Because of this seeking heart, they became the first worshipers of the newborn Messiah along with the shepherds in the field. Isn't it ironic? The priests and teachers of the law were the ones who had the Bible, who had the knowledge of God, and who knew where Christ would be born. They should have come to Bethlehem before the wise men and worshipped the newborn baby first. But these people were not interested in looking for the newborn king. They were not even waiting for the Messiah. They had no expectations at all in their heart for Christ. They had so much knowledge of God in their heads, but they had no desire for God in their hearts. When we look at the priests and teachers of the law in today's text, I wonder if we are such believers as them. All of us have been Christian for a long time. 
for some of you, maybe all your life, we have the Bible. We know the Bible. We read the Bible. We study the Bible. How knowledgeable we are when we come to the Bible. But the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is, how much desire do we have for God? Do we expect God in our lives? Do we want God to rule our lives as a king? If not, what's the difference between the teachers of the law and us? Does our knowledge of God make us closer to God? Does our Bible study motivate us to expect God to walk in our lives? Does our daily meditation or recitation of God's word set us apart from the rest of the world? In John chapter 6, we find Jesus feeding 5,000 people with the five loaves of bread and two fish. It was a boy's lunch. And Jesus fed 5,000 people with it. If we include the women and children in the crowd, it must have been more than 10,000 people. It was a miracle. So people were very excited by this miracle. Even after the day was over, they remained on the field to be with Jesus. The next day, when they found out Jesus was on the other side of the lake, they even crossed the lake in the boat to see him. So when Jesus saw people coming to him again, he started explaining the true meaning of the miracle he performed the day before. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But do you know what happened? People started leaving Jesus one by one complaining his words were too hard to understand. Finally, everybody left except his 12 disciples. From 10,000 to 12. Compare Jesus' ministry, we are not that bad. We have more than 12 here, right? Jesus was very sorry to see the crowd leaving. So he asked his disciples, this question. If they also wanted to leave. But fortunately, Peter had the right answer to this question. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. What a perfect timing and perfect answer. The word crowd is not that often positively used in the Bible. Crowd is a group of people who come and go without any specific purpose. They gather if there are any good shows to watch, but they leave once the shows are over. During Jesus' three-year public ministry, he has been surrounded by crowds all the time. Therefore, many times, he had to move away from the crowds to have his personal quiet time with God. However, among all these people, not many were truly interested in Jesus. They were more interested in the miracles Jesus performed than in Jesus himself. Not many had a true desire for God. They were not interested in meeting God who incarnated in Jesus Christ amongst them. Most of us come to this place every Sunday for a worship service. You can come here with the same attitude as the wise man, seeking and desiring truth. Most importantly, God's presence in our lives. Or we can come here like the crowd with no true desire for God, just to fulfill our religious duty. The priests and teachers of the law in today's text were not true seekers of God. 
we can say they were like the crowds who were only interested in the power and privilege coming from their title, position, and knowledge. They had a knowledge of God. They knew God all their lives, and they memorized the words by heart, but there was no expectation, no desire, no yearning for God. So who are we like? Are we like the, man, the wise man or priest or teachers of the law or the crowds? Now returning to our text, the wise man finally found out where the newborn, new king would be born and they visited Bethlehem towards Jesus by presenting the gifts they had brought all the way from the east. Their bringing gifts to Jesus tells us another fact about the wise man's attitude toward Jesus. During Jesus' three-year ministry, not many people brought gifts to Jesus. Not many people gave up their precious things for Jesus. If I remember, there was a lady who brought a jar of perfume and break it to prepare for Jesus' death. There was an owner of a court who gave up his animal for Jesus' entry to Jerusalem. There was a man named Joseph from Arimathus who gave up his tombstone for Jesus. But all others, they were more interested in receiving gifts from God, from Jesus. Therefore, wise men's bringing gifts to Jesus means they were truly interested in the baby Jesus, the newborn king, the truth. What is the source of your joy? Do you find joy in Jesus or all the good gifts coming from Jesus? Are you interested in Jesus, who is the bread of life, or the, the bread he makes for you? Are you like the crowd, the priests, teachers of the law, or the wise man? This should be an important question while we are waiting for the birth of Jesus during this Advent season. Lastly, from today's text, I would like to talk about Jesus' birthplace, Bethlehem, briefly. Even if you're not Christians, you will know the town Bethlehem, right? Everybody knows. There's nobody who does not know the town Bethlehem. In Jesus' time, the Bethlehem was not a big town. Compared to Jerusalem, it was a very small town, population ranging from 300 to 500 according to historians. You know, we have a hymn, right? O little town of Bethlehem. It's a little. But an interesting fact is that since Jesus was born in this small town, Bethlehem hasn't been considered small anymore. Now Bethlehem has become a big name. Everybody in this world knows. Because of what? Yes, because Jesus was born in this small town. Very often, people in this world think the size of their lives depend on how much money or power they have or high, how high they reach. But look at the King Herod. He was a king who had all the power and money, but unfortunately, there was no place for God in his heart. Instead, his heart was full of greed and pride. Therefore, he became such a small, evil man who gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. The real size of our lives does not depend on what we see. The big house, the big business, the big bank accounts, the big property, these things do not make our lives big. 
who's in your heart determines the size of your life. When we have a Jesus in our hearts, when we make room for God in our hearts, our lives become truly big, something that future generations will remember. The book of Romans is one of the most read, studied books in the Bible. It is because we find all the fundamental Christian doctrines in this book. Even if you don't know the rest of books in the Bible, you can still come to the faith of salvation by reading only this book. That's why many Bible teachers and pastors regarded the book of Romans as their most favorite. Because of this book, a famous saint, Saint Augustine, could appear in the history of Christianity. While Augustine was reading the book of Romans, he gave his life to Jesus and became one of the most influential theologians who wrote numerous books about the Christian faith. Because of this book, the book of Romans, Martin Luther was able to ignite the flame of the Reformation in the 16th century. The, therefore, the book of Romans takes in Christian history is unmeasurable. The book of Romans has a total of 16 chapters, and especially chapter 16, the last chapter, if you are not patient enough, you may not be able to finish reading the whole chapter. The reason is, it is all about Paul's greeting too many different people. Greet this one or that one. On and on and on. We may ask this question, why is Paul mentioning all the names that are even hard to pronounce? Why is he taking the whole chapter in this last chapter of his book to mention their names? It is because without them, there would be no Apostle Paul in Christian history. Without their service and dedication, the Apostle Paul could not have completed his mission trips. With not these names, 13 out of 27 books in the New Testament would never have been written. These people made it possible for the book of Romans to be born. Because of this book, St. Augustine and Martin Luther could appear in Christian history and change the flow of human history. That is why Paul is greeting all these names one by one in his last chapter of the book of Romans with a sincerely grateful heart. Their names may appear in the Bible just once or twice, but their names are never small. These names are truly the greatest of all. What makes these names great? Is it their wealth? Is it their talent? Is it their job? Is it their something big in their life? Are these names are great because of what they have? No. By a human standard, they are nothing to be boastful of. They were just the ordinary men and women. Then what makes them great? It was their love for God. They had a Jesus in their heart. Therefore, they were willing to sacrifice their lives for Jesus and his kingdom. Their faith in Jesus made their names great. The true value of our life does not come from the outside. It comes from the inside, not from what we have, but from who we are. Are you a person of God? Is it Jesus dwelling in your life? Are you letting Jesus lead your life as the Lord and King? These questions will determine the true size of our lives. If we can say yes, all these questions our lives are never small. When our life becomes a life with God, 
it truly becomes the greatest life we can ever in this life. On Christmas Day, God demonstrated His presence with us through His Son, Jesus, Emmanuel. Now the question remaining for us is, will we be making space for Jesus to be born in our hearts during this blessed season? Will we desire God to rule in our lives? Will we acknowledge God in our thoughts and decisions? When we show this world that we are truly men and women of God through our Christian love and sacrifice, these are the questions we should answer as we wait for the birth of Jesus Christ. In this world, however hard you try, only a few can be great. But in God's kingdom, everybody can be great. In this world, not everybody can be famous. But in God's kingdom, we all can be famous. It is just a matter of who's in our heart. Bethlehem has been invisible and unknown to people before Jesus was born. But after Jesus was born in this small town, it has become a truly big name everybody in this world knows. When Jesus is born into our lives, our lives will never be the same. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and King, we become true conquerors of this world and the heirs of God's kingdom. The question is, do we believe this? Now, as we are we are waiting for Jesus' birth during this blessed season. Do we feel the same joy as the wise man experienced 2,000 years ago? Are we excited by the news of baby Jesus? Do we have a room for Jesus? I sincerely pray that we all restore our love and desire for God during this Advent season so we also can rejoice exceedingly with a great joy on Christmas Day. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your words. Through your words, we look at ourselves to see if we have a you in our hearts. Lord, while we are waiting for, the, for Jesus during this wonderful season, help us to make room for your son Jesus so that we let our life ruled by your son Jesus, our Lord and King. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.